Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Briz Science. Uh, thank you for all coming out, and those of you braving public transport, thanks for waiting. Um, here there was some great traffic today, unlike at the Commonwealth Games. Um, so, welcome to Briz Science, the University of Queensland's free public lecture series on science, where we bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research and their passions with Brisbane. Uh, we are, of course, brought to you by the University of Queensland. This is just one of the many outreach activities that the University of Queensland does, and I'd encourage, it's obviously the best of them, but I encourage you to hop onto the UQ Events website and check those out. We've also got some great things for students coming up at the moment, um, particularly one of the programs I used to run, which is the Junior Physics Olympiad, JFO, uh, fantastic program, learning everything from quantum physics to circus juggling and fire twirling and so forth. So if you've got a student um, mid-high school, really great program, check that out. Um, we're also here hosted at The Edge, part of the State Library of Queensland, and they also have some fantastic programs, lots of great workshops, and their maker space downstairs, so also check that out. And I would like to, of course, respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight, and to pay my respect to elders both past and present. And I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. A uh, couple of bits of housekeeping before we get started. We're going to introduce our speaker in a moment, and then there'll be a chance for you to ask questions, and you can do that either on those handy question sheets you found on the way in, or through the wonders of technology through Twitter with the hashtag BrizScience. And we will try and, at the end of this talk, get through as many of those questions as we can. Uh, afterwards, we have food and drink provided outside, so I'd love to encourage you to hang around, have a chat, and um, discuss more about everything you're going to learn tonight. Okay, I think that's everything we need to do. So without further ado, my great pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Ben Schultz from the University of Queensland, where he's an associate professor in biochemistry and his research broadly is into the way that proteins operate and how they're made, modified, and regulated. But tonight, he's going to talk about a topic that I know is going to be very near and dear to the hearts of many of us here, which is yeast. And in particular, the role of yeast in beer and brewing. So, and some of the wild yeasts that you might find around Brisbane. So please join me to tell us more about wild yeasts and tasty beers. Join me in welcoming Ben Schultz. Thank you very much, Joel, for that kind introduction, and to all of you for turning up, braving the public transport, as Joel mentioned, but I'm sure we'll have a lovely evening. Although I'm very disappointed that we only have water here for my refreshment instead of beer, but uh, it's not bad that Brisbane tap water. All right, so um, I'll start off um, first just by uh, acknowledging the people who have supported this work. So uh, my position um, at the University of Queensland is uh, supported by the National Health and Medical Research Council, and my research is also supported by the Australian Research Council. And the research um, by a PhD student, Edward Kerr, who I'll be talking about tonight, is supported uh, by Newstead Brewing in association with the Queensland Government and the Advanced Queensland Scheme. So, without further ado, we'll uh, jump into things. So beer, it's magnificent, right? I'm sure we can all agree, right? I mean, just look at it, it's, it's crisp and refreshing. You can smell the lovely hops aroma coming off the top. You can feel the nice cool glass, see the little bubbles coming up and, and giving that delightful foam head. It's, it's truly delicious and refreshing, but when you think about look a little bit more closely at it, especially with a biochemist's and a microbiologist's eye, it's even more interesting, I think. So we can take a little look about what really is in a glass of beer. So, of course, most of a glass of beer is just water, right? It's like 95% water. Um, that's probably not why we drink it, but it's an important component. Um, the other bit is ethanol, right? So the waste product of yeast, perhaps the main reason why we drink beer, um, and that certainly provides flavor and, and the, uh, the mental effects. <laughs> Beyond that, we've got carbon dioxide. In most beers, it's critical for the, the carbonation and also for the acidity in, in the beer itself. But then beyond that, we get to some much more interesting and complex components. So we have hop acids that come from the hops and give bitterness and, uh, and, and flavor. 
and a variety of complex esters that are produced as secondary metabolites, byproducts of yeast fermentation. These sort of uh, give pineapple-y, banana-y, um, or sort of old buttery flavors, depending on whether you've had a, a successful or not so successful fermentation. But then beyond that as well, we've got malts and maltose as a leftover sugar from, uh, from the, the fermentation that the yeast didn't completely get through. And this um, gives a surprisingly malty flavor to the beer. But then we also have long extended polysaccharides, large sugar molecules that haven't been properly digested. And these are really important for mouthfeel, sort of for giving a, a creaminess and velvetiness to, to beers, especially the heavier, uh, stouty type beers. But there's also more interesting complex molecules like proteins, the leftover in beer. And these come from the barley grain itself. They've been extracted out from the barley. And they've also been produced and secreted into the beer by the yeast during fermentation. And that brings us to the, the last thing, which might be in your beer. Probably not if it's from a, a filtered commercial beer. Um, but it'll definitely be there um, in, in homebrew. And uh, some non-filtered or bottle uh, um, fermented and bottled uh, carbonated beers, there'll be yeast. So here we've got some yeast growing on an agar plate. And um, this sort of brings, uh, brings to a head the reason why I managed to get involved in the wonderful world of beer research. Because in my, my day job, as it were, at the University of Queensland, I'm a lecturer and researcher in protein biochemistry. So I'm interested in how proteins are made, how they fold, how they're modified and regulated, and what they do inside a cell and especially how they interact with complex carbohydrates and sugars. And a key part of our research is to use a model organism, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or brewer's yeast, because it's a microorganism, it's easy to grow and work with in the lab, we can do genetic experiments, but it's also, at a cellular level, really very similar to the cells from our own bodies. And so we can learn a lot about fundamental processes in biology in a really easy uh, lab setting. So, uh, that's sort of the background for what I was doing in the lab, doing really interesting fundamental science, when um, a couple of years back, um, some, some news hit that uh, Vegemite was perhaps being used in, in dry indigenous communities and also in prisons around Australia to make beer. Um, and this was, at the time, it was reported that um, the Vegemite was being used as a source of yeast for these fermentations, because Vegemite is, in fact, made from spent brewer's yeast. So yeast that's uh, left over at the end of a fermentation is shipped on down to craft. They boil it up, add lots of salts, do their magic, it turns into the, the delicious goo that we've all been tricked to think is delicious. Um, <laughs> if you're from Australia, that is, of course. There are other international competitors, but Vegemite's the best by far. Um, so it, it's pretty clear from that process that there could be nothing left alive in Vegemite. It's been boiled, salted, there's nothing living in there. Um, and yet, it was apparently being used to, um, to make something similar to beer. Um, so we wrote a little uh, uh, column for the conversation to get me and myself and, and my colleague Maggie Hardy. Um, and uh, that was, was where it sat. But then I had a, a, an honors student in the lab, Ed Kerr, who uh, as a side project decided that he really just had to try out to see if, if this could possibly be true, if we could actually make something like beer with Vegemite. So we confirmed that there was nothing living in Vegemite that we could buy from the shop anyway. Um, but then we, we had the idea that since Vegemite is basically a yeast extract, it has everything in it that yeast need to grow, except for the sugar. So we did a pretty simple experiment. We added yeast, our own lab yeast, Vegemite, and sugar, and water, of course. And only when all of those things were present did fermentation happen, and very efficiently at that. So this probably suggested that in these environments where alcohol was, was not uh, legally obtainable, people were able to uh, get a, a sort of a sugary solution, add a scoop of Vegemite, and then yeast could fall in from, from the air, because yeast is all around us, basically. Um, and then the Vegemite just provided that little bit of nutrition for the yeast that it needed to, to go off and grow. So um, Vegemite could, in fact, be used as a nutrient source, so providing a source of amino nitrogen and proteins for the yeast to grow, as long as you add sugar and the yeast as well. So, of course, being a keen home brewer, I, I had to try this out at home myself. That's my hand in my backyard. Um, it's a lovely Brisbane spring day. The beer itself, or the beer, isn't particularly palatable, but it was, it was interesting. And uh, 
certainly uh, it, it's a nice base to which all sorts of interesting flavor compounds could be added potentially. Like there's definitely potential in, in Vegemite beer. But luckily, um, we moved on to much bigger and much better things. Um, because um, as my honor student, uh, Ed Kerr, was finishing his honors, he was wondering what he should do, if he should stay in, in, in research to do a PhD, or perhaps if he should go out and get a job at a brewery. That would be his dream job. When Dr. Mark Howes, the, the owner of Newstead Brewery, approached us, um, he himself had done his PhD and postdoc at the University of Queensland, and he was keen to get back in touch with us and um, with academic research and, and see what sort of partnership could be built. So, of course, we jumped at this opportunity, um, and Ed was uh, awarded then a, an advanced Queensland um, PhD scholarship for this work. So there he is, Ed Kerr, with um, the, the then science minister, Leanne Enoch, and Dr. Mark Howes enjoying a, a quiet morning pint at Newstead. Um, so, this is a pretty fantastic project, right? We've both fallen completely on our feet and we can now do beer research, right? This is extraordinary. Um, and the, the, uh, the goal, though, is to make beer better. And perhaps we're being a little bit ambitious there, right? Because beer is pretty good. Um, but that's, that's what we're all about. So, um, before we can get into how you might make beer better, we'll just take a step back and briefly work through the history of beer. So beer has basically been with us for as long, more or less, as there's been human civilization, right? There's, um, we've got these Mesopotamian cuneiforms, so clay um, bricks that um, is writing on, and more or less the, the earliest of these is a, a description accounting for barley, um, making sure that the amount of barley that was taken in and stored was then sold appropriately, and of course, the use for this barley was in making beer, right? So um, beer has been with us a very long time, thousands of years. Um, although back then, it probably wasn't really the, the crisp, clean lager or the nice, spicy IPA that we would expect now, but perhaps a contaminated, spicy porridge is more on the line, right? So um, the way, as far as we can tell from interpreting the, uh, the recipes, which have been left from this time, um, that, that this beverage was made is that grain was left to molt or to germinate, then boiled up, more or less like a, a spicy, or more or less like a, a porridge, a multi porridge. Um, and then various spices and things were, were added to it. And um, basically, the, the, they got as creative as they could, right? Any sort of herb or, um, or plants could be thrown in. Um, and that was really important because those botanicals that were added often contained antibacterial compounds that stopped bacteria spoiling the, um, the brew. Um, but then they would let it sit for a while, wild yeast would fall in, and it would uh, eventually ferment into something which, well, I don't know, they seem to be enjoying themselves up there, but I'm not really sure how, how palatable it would really be, but everything's relative. So this was undoubtedly popular, though, because beer or, or derivatives of it um, spread around the world. Um, and I guess the next uh, major change, noteworthy event in the history of beer, about a little bit over 500 years ago, um, in fact, it was, it was the 500-year anniversary celebrated a year or two back, was the, the German Reinheitsgebot, or purity law, which enacted, um, specified that beer could only contain water and malt and hops. They didn't say yeast back then because this was pre-microbiology and they hadn't really an idea that it was necessary. Um, but still, the other two ingredients are noteworthy, right? The hops and the malt. So the hops was specified probably as a, a throwback to um, the, the necessity to add something botanical to a brew to minimize bacterial contamination. But that something could be almost anything. And so people would get a little bit creative with what they put in. And sometimes the side effects of, of those exciting botanicals weren't really as predictable as, as was liked. And so hops was nice and potent, it was an antimicrobial, didn't have too many other exciting side effects. But the other reason was probably a little bit of a trade war going on, and um, barley was mainly grown in the south of Germany, whereas wheat in the north, and so by limiting beer production to, to barley, um, that gave a little bit of an advantage for the, uh, the locals. And apparently also, um, this rule was in instigated to make sure that wheat was left um, to be made into bread rather than in a much more lucrative beer, right? So you gotta make sure that your populace is well fed and not just making money and getting drunk all the time. <laughs> 
Um, but um, this sort of basically um, uh, set, the stat the set the status quo for beer production um, until the next uh, big innovation of lager production. So um, lagers are the most popular beer in the world still, and the, the key defining fact about their production is that they're made with fermentation in cellars that are cold, so sort of four degrees to 10 degrees Celsius. And normal beer that um, is in ales, for instance, bakers and brewing yeast, it really doesn't grow at that temperature. It only grows between sort of 15 and 20 degrees. And uh, in the last couple of years, some really nice genomic detective work has shown that it was actually the, the conquistadors um, from South America, or from Europeans going to South America, somehow bringing back yeast from Patagonian beech trees. And this yeast then found its way by some circuitous route into the, uh, the German or East European um, uh, beer producing monasteries and hybridized with ale yeast to create lager yeast that could still grow efficiently and make beer, but because it was from a cold environment, could grow in the cold temperatures in the European cellars. And so then this lager beer took over the world because at growth, with growth at low temperatures, there weren't as many interesting, uh, unexpected, funky flavors in, in the beer, and the, the lager beer was and still is um, palatable and popular. So with that history of beer, now, I'd just like to go through the modern beer making process. It's basically unchanged, right, since thousands of years ago, but just with some industrial optimization and efficiencies. So we've still got those four key ingredients, barley, water, hops, and yeast, and it starts off with the barley. So barley is the seed of a, of a grass, like wheat, and that's picked and then malted. Now, the, the point of a barley seed is so that when it falls into the ground and it gets rained on, it can grow and make another barley plant, right? That's, that's the point, that's why the plant makes barley seed. And so inside that seed is all of the energy and the nutrients that the baby plant needs to grow. It's got a source of sugars, of protein, everything else it needs. The point of malting is to basically trick the seed to begin germination, to begin the process of freeing those sugars and proteins and nutrients, but to then stop the process so that the, the seed doesn't actually germinate and those nutrients are available instead for the yeast to use to grow. So that malting process happens, then uh, the process is stopped, the seed is dried and, and uh, ground into a, a grist, sort of not quite as fine as flour, but, uh, but ground. And then that's added to hot water in the mash, and here this is basically a hot water extraction. So we have finely ground malt, barley, which is then extracted. So the proteins and the starch get solubilized, everything gets digested, and then boiled with hops added to release bitterness to uh, sterilize the solution. Then after this is cooled, yeast, the final step, is added, and the magic of fermentation begins. So the yeast eats all of the nutrients which were meant for the barley, um, baby barley plants, but are now being used by the yeast. So the sugars and proteins um, get eaten. The yeast produces ethanol and carbon dioxide, and it turns into beer, which then, in an industrial setting, is uh, carbonated, bottled, and uh, ready to be sold and consumed. And that's just so delicious, I need another drink. So this whole process um, involves, uh, it's surprisingly simple perhaps, but at, at each, of each stage there's, there's really interesting protein biochemistry and microbiology that happens, right? So for instance, the germination process is an intricate biological um, process of, of uh, embryogenesis. Then in the mash, there's really interesting protein chemistry and sugar chemistry going on. Of course, in the fermentation, the yeast is growing and, and fermenting, and there's incredibly interesting metabolism that's happening there. So in the first step of trying to make beer better, we wondered if we could use techniques in, in modern protein biochemistry and systems biology to really take a closer look at this process, to understand it in molecular detail and use that to advise how the process works. And we did that by looking at this mashing step, this hot water extraction. So in the mash, you start off with malted barley grains and add hot water. So this hot water extracts out proteins and polysaccharides, 
And if the temperature is right, these proteins are enzymes that degrade the polysaccharide into smaller sugars, maltose sugars here, that are the carbon source, the food for the yeast. But that's not the only protein which is in these seeds. There are also proteases, so proteins that degrade other proteins. And here they, they'll partially snip this protein into two, but in the natively developing embryo, and if, if this kept going in the mash, these proteases would digest proteins down to amino acids or very short peptides. They're used as a source of nitrogen and amino acids, ideally for the growing barley seed, but also in this case for the yeast. But then what's also critical is that during the mash, it starts off at a low temperature and then increases to a higher temperature. And as you get to a higher temperature, proteins begin to unfold and coagulate, a bit like when you boil an egg, right? It goes from being soft and squishy and soluble to hard and, and boiled. And the same thing will happen to these proteins. So at high temperatures, these proteins will tend to aggregate, or unfold and aggregate, and then fall out of solution. So they won't be present in the final beer. So we investigated this process um, using modern mass spectrometry proteomics to identify and measure proteins at, at different points throughout this mash. So first, the first thing we found was pretty amazing is that we could identify over 200 proteins throughout this process, right? So beer is a really complex, um, protein-rich sample, right? Then we monitored the, uh, the, the kinetics throughout this process, and as expected, we saw that at, at lower temperatures, proteins increased in abundance because they were being extracted out of the seed and into the solution. But then at higher temperatures, around about 80 degrees, they precipitately dropped out of solution, precipitated, um, because they were unfolding and disappearing. So that was as expected. But it was a bit surprising then that we found that um, even in boiling, 100 degrees, there was still a fraction of these proteins that survived into the boil. And we were a bit curious about what this might be caused by. So we looked in a little bit more detail at, at our data and saw that we could measure not only the presence of a protein, but also the precise sites in that protein that had been clipped by the proteases, the enzymes that digested proteins in the mash. And we could see that at lower temperatures, there were lots of these clipped proteins. But once we got to higher temperatures, only the unclipped intact form of the protein survived. So basically, this was saying that uh, when you had a protein by itself, it could survive into the boil. But as soon as another enzyme came along and clipped that protein, that would make it a little bit unsteady so that when the temperature increased, it was much more likely to unfold and disappear out of solution. So that was a really interesting uh, sort of fundamental protein biochemistry observation, but it's also really important for understanding how protein biochemistry happens during the mash. Because if we have these proteins, enzymes that can degrade those proteins into two smaller parts, then that will mean that there's less of those proteins in the final beer. And that may affect all sorts of properties of the beer, like its color, how much foam there is, how, much, how stable that foam is, I mean, even the taste of the beer. But it will also affect how the sugars are degraded, because if there's not so much proteolysis, then there'll be lots of active enzyme, and the starch will be degraded into sugars, and there'll be a lot more sugar for the yeast to turn into ethanol. Whereas if these proteins are, are clipped before they can degrade the starch, there won't be as much sugar, there won't be as much ethanol in the final beer, but instead there'll be lots of starch that's remaining in the beer. And so this balance is, is dynamic, and it depends on the proteins, and the starch that are present in the barley seed, but also then on, on the process parameters that happen during the mash. So we think that using modern systems biology type approaches like this can give us really useful insights into making the, the beer brewing process more efficient. And that's nice, it's good to have beer that's reliably made, maybe even more cheaply made, but really it would be better to make exciting beer, right? We want, we want to make beer better, or at least different. So how can we go about doing that? So um, most of the beer that's sold in the world at the moment is lager beer. This is because it's inoffensive, some might even say boring, it goes with everything, um, and it's easy and refreshing to drink. But luckily, over the last decade or so, there's been a resurgence in sort of more interesting types of beer. And in the craft beer scene, this has largely been driven by the use of hops, hop-driven flavors. So your, your IPAs, 
New England IPAs, XPAs, red, uh, red ale IPAs. And this is fantastic. Hoppy beers are, are delicious and refreshing. And uh, perhaps the reason, though, that this has been so successful is that it's relatively easy to make something which is different tasting. Right? You can make a relatively standard beer, just add in lots of hops or different types of hops, and you get a different flavor beer. Right? So it's, it's uh, quite easy for the craft breweries to make something which is different and delicious, which is good for us. Um, but perhaps you can get a little bit too much of hops, right? and, and there are other things out there as well. But of course, ales have got a very long tradition of hugely diverse and uh, delicious and interesting flavors. So specifically thinking about Belgian ales, right there, there's a uh, huge diversity in, in flavor and types of, types of beer that are not so hop driven. But instead, those flavors are largely driven by the yeast. And yeast is really critical in providing uh, not only the ethanol, but also the flavors in those ales. But, and this is I guess the point, yeast isn't just yeast, right? But there's a huge diversity of different organisms that are, are fungi, that are microscopic fungi, that would be yeasts that you could use to make something like beer. So this picture at the top is uh, a microscopic, microscopy picture of a Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so it's a standard ale yeast. But the Saccharomyces paradoxus, the lager yeast, looks pretty similar. And those two yeasts are, uh, are basically used in pretty much every brewery around the world to make the standard ales and lagers that we all enjoy. If, on the other hand, we look down the bottom, we see much more exciting things happening, right? I mean, we've got barrels here that are exploding out with, with foam and, and flavor and uh, perhaps more interesting, um, colorful descriptors of the smells there. But the, the main mechanism by which brewers obtain interesting beers here um, is by using a mixture of different types of yeast and even bacteria. Right? So these um, microscopic pictures here show that there's uh, a mixture of different species and perhaps not even defined species that are used in these fermentations. And it certainly produces a, a wealth of different types of beer, right? We can't just say there are sour beers and they're one small category. No, there's, there's a huge diversity within sour and, and funky beers. Um, and here are uh, just a few here, right? So, I mean, you've got the Berliner Weisse, which is a, a sour beer that's, that's brewed with bacteria as well as yeast. Um, Brett beer, uh, which is, is brewed with Brettanomyces. It's often a, a contaminant in, in wine. Um, that gives really particular sort of leathery, smelly foot type flavors. Um, something is delicious, right? <laughs> um, and then in the middle there, we've got perhaps one of the bravest of all is, is the lambics, right? So these come from a particular valley, the Lamb Valley in Belgium, and they're, they're amazing sour beers, but um, you perhaps shouldn't think too much too carefully about how they're made, right? So here's sketched out. Basically, um, these breweries uh, make worts, so as we described in the process, right, they get barley, malt it, mash it up, boil it, and then they, they need to cool it, right? And, and these guys thought, ah, oh, it's, it's too slow if we leave it inside, let's just put it outside, right? So they take their, their barrel or their, their um, wheelbarrow or, or pot of beer, of wort, sorry, and, and leave it outside to cool overnight. And wind blows, who knows what in, birds fly overhead, do who know what, and um, all sorts of interesting things drop in to that wort as it's cooling. And whatever falls in, stays in. When the, when the wort's cooled, gets taken back inside, put into barrels, and left for up to a year or two for fermentation to happen. And I mean, the, the microbiology that goes on here is, is really amazing, right? There's waves of organisms that, that come and then go, and then others that come and, and take their place. And that, that really gives the final sour beer um, really interesting and complex flavors that's often dominated by a sort of lip puckering acidity and uh, um, super sourness. But they're, they're delicious. But of course, th there are problems with this process, right? I mean, it takes a very long time. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's really subject to the whims of, of nature, right? Whatever microorganisms happen to fall into your wort when you leave it outside, they're the ones you end up with in your beer. And that, that's really, that might be interesting, you might get different flavors with every vintage, but 
it, it doesn't lend itself to a, a reproducible efficient process or to a, a, a nice predictable consumer um, uh, environment. So what if you could have the benefits of, of this but without this risk by instead of leaving your word open to the environment, selecting a single variety of yeast that you knew performed well and inoculating that yourself into the wort. So there you could still select for yeast that were going to give interesting flavors, but you weren't going to be subject to, to randomness and to contamination. And you could still get interesting flavored beer. And more, more, moreover, you could select all sorts of different yeasts to make beer with many different flavors and, and properties. And this is where we're, we're trying to come from with, with getting better beer or more exciting beer flavors. So that's all well and good, but where are we going to get this yeast from, right? So I guess the first point is that that's actually not too hard, right? Yeast is all around us. I mean, there'll be yeast spores floating through this room, and certainly when you're outside in the environment, there's yeast everywhere attached to animals, to plants, floating through the air and the soil and in the water. But perhaps it, it uh, bears considering what the, the natural ecology of yeast is before thinking about where you might go and collect yeast. So wild yeast actually has a bit of a problem, right? Because it likes eating fruit, but it's a microbe, right? So it can't really just walk around, get from fruit to fruit. Luckily, it's uh, teamed up symbiotically with the fruit fly. So here's a really big one, a Drosophila. You probably see much smaller, more friendlier ones in your fruit bowl at home. Um, and these little guys love eating fruit. But I guess more to the point, what they actually love eating is yeast that grows on that fruit. So the yeast secrete uh, small molecules that attract the flies, and the flies eat up the yeast. Right? So on the first uh, line, that seems like a bit of a harsh deal for the yeast. They just get eaten by the fly. They provide the fly with a really good food source. But it's not too bad, actually, because some of the yeast can form spores and survive through the fly's intestine. So then when the fly flies around and lands on another piece of fruit, does a poo, the yeast comes out and gets deposited there. So the yeast, by that mechanism, can move from fruit to fruit, colonize that new uh, untouched territory, grow, turn the sugars into ethanol, um, and produce more yeast so that the fly can come back and eat and the cycle continues. So that's, that suggests that, uh, that, that fruit is going to be a really useful spot to look for, for yeast. Um, and that's a good place to start, but it also um, raises a complication that the, the sugar that's present in fruits and also in most plants is sucrose. So there's the molecular structure of sucrose there. You probably know it um, more commonly as, as just table sugar. Right? So sucrose is a common sugar, it's a common plant sugar. Basically all organisms like to use sucrose. That's not a problem. Except if you want to make beer, because we've just showed that um, when you have starch that you've extracted from barley seeds, digested that to maltose, that's the carbon source, that's the sugar that's present in the wort that we need the yeast to eat. And these are not the same thing, right? Maltose is uh, basically it's a key ingredient in Milo, right? So, which is tasty for us, we can eat all of these things, but yeast, they're evolved to grow on fruits, um, and there's lots of sucrose there, but there's very little maltose. And so this is a key difficulty with using wild yeast to make beer, is that they're evolved to use the wrong sort of, of sugar source. So this, as an aside, um, is why it's quite easy to make wine with wild yeast. You can basically just take any grapes, mush them up, anything that goes in there will be able to eat the sucrose and grow. If you want to make beer, it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so there must be these fantastic yeasts out there somewhere, right, that um, can give interesting flavors and grow on maltose, but how are we going to get them? So luckily, we uh, could come up with a, a workflow that started with going out into the environment around Brisbane and collecting samples basically of plants, so leaves, bark, flowers, fruit, um, and taking them back into the lab and isolating yeast from those. So we got the biological, the, the vegetable samples, as it were, washed them in media, let them grow for a little bit, and then plated out that media onto agar plates so that we could select single colonies of yeast. So this is a really critical step because rather than having just a mixed population of whatever happened to be present when you opened your, uh, your door at that time, 
we could go to having a single strain of yeast that we knew was only that strain, right? So that's a requirement for having a reproducible process, you know, that whenever we add that yeast, we're gonna get the same beer at the end. So we had to do that first. But then the next step was to make sure that the yeast we had isolated could actually grow on maltose. Uh, so that was the next step here. So we could just grow them in the lab and confirm whether or not they could grow on maltose rather than sucrose. Then we could use gas chromatography to measure quantitatively the amount of ethanol that these yeasts produce, and we could use genomic sequencing to identify the species of yeast. We just did this for the ones that could grow that we were interested in. Following that, if we had a yeast that could grow on worts and could produce ethanol, then we tested it in a more uh, brewery-like environment where we had fermentations at 10 degrees or at 20 degrees, sort of corresponding to your typical lager or ale fermentations, and then performed gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, or high-performance liquid chromatography to, uh, to profile the, the small organic molecules in the beers, or in the, the beer that we've made in the lab here, um, to, to profile the sorts of molecules which would be contributing to the flavor of those beers. And then, of course, for a select few, we moved on to the, really the, the gold standard, the sensory evaluation. Because it doesn't really matter what your analytical instruments say, it's the, the proof in the end is in the sensory um, evaluation, sensory perception of the beer. So, Eds then went out on the town, wandered around the University of Queensland at St. Lucia, and also the Botanic Gardens at Mount Cutha, and selected uh, tens of different uh, samples from, from plants growing around. Took them back to the lab, isolated some yeast, and here's a, a selection of, of some of the few that we identified. So you can see in there that there is a Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so that's the traditional brewer's yeast, but we only found one of those out of a couple of hundred yeasts that we've isolated so far. So they're out there around Brisbane, but they're pretty rare. But instead, we found a, a huge diversity, a plethora of other yeasts, so lots of Tyrellosporas and Candidas and all sorts of other exciting names that I, I won't even try and pronounce up here on stage live. So there's fantastic diversity in these yeasts. And I should just emphasize that although these sort of all look more or less the same on an agar plate or under the microscope, they're actually incredibly diverse and different organisms genetically. So for instance, here, if we're looking at the Saccharomyces and the Candida, these, although they're quite close on this, uh, this dendrogram here, this evolutionary tree, those two species are, are more or less as alike as we are, as humans are from frogs, right? So there's a whole lot of genomic diversity within these organisms. So we could isolate yeast. They're, they are out there in and around Brisbane, even though you can't see them. Then we took them back into the lab and screened them to see which could grow on wort. So for this, it's a pretty simple experiment, really. We, we made some wort in the lab and then uh, left that on the bench, either without any inoculation or inoculated with some of the yeasts that we'd found. And then, every day, we measured the weight of that wort. So it started off with a, a set of mass. When the yeast grew, if it did indeed grew, that if it did indeed grow, it would turn the sugar into ethanol and carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide would bubble up and leave the, the flask and reduce the mass in the flask. So we could follow the course of fermentation just by weighing. So this is easy because we can do this on many samples at once. We don't have to do detailed chemical analyses. We can just weigh the things. So you can see that we've got, uh, well, first just wort at the top there. It just goes straight across. So basically there's just evaporation that's happening there and nothing is growing. But if we add in yeast that's really good at making beer, so USO5 and M20, they're just two strains of yeast which are commonly used in craft brewery, we can see that they take a little while to get going and then really quickly they use the, uh, the sugar, turn it into carbon dioxide and ethanol and the, uh, the bottles lose, lose weight, lose mass. And then in between, this is just a selection here, but there's lots of lines that show that most of these yeasts are indeed growing, some more slowly, some more quickly, but there's, there's a good bit of growth in here. So that's great. It means that these yeast, which we've selected, we've just pulled out of the wild, even though they've evolved to just grow on sucrose, 
when we take them into their really nasty environment of that wort, they can still grow and uh, hopefully make something which is a little like beer. But many of these yeast didn't grow particularly quickly. All right? And so we made sure that when we're screening hundreds of yeast here that we're only selecting those which are going to grow reasonably quickly so that when hopefully we're making a, a 10,000 litre ferment of these down the track, they're not going to take a month to finish the ferment, but they're going to be relatively quick. And we could find some of those. Then we progressed to, um, to measuring the ethanol concentration and most of these strains of yeast produced a good amount of ethanol. And you can see here that there's a nice correlation between the mass loss and the ethanol production, which sort of makes sense. The more sugar that they're using, the more ethanol they're producing. That's great. But we could also, using a gas chromatography mass spectrometry, identify and measure other compounds that these yeast were making. Because many of them were making lots of ethanol. You can see by those red bars there. And the, uh, the blue bars are the weight loss, so there's a, a reasonable correlation there. But then if you look down in the grass, there's a whole lot of other things happening. There's lots of orange, acetone, green, ethyl acetate, and other sort of nasty organic solventy-like things. Now, a little bit of those can be quite nice, give a nice bouquet to your beer, but you don't really want to be drinking nail polish remover, right? So, we have to be a little bit careful there with, with screening, and this is gas chromatography is a really nice tool for um, identifying uh, diverse compounds which will be present. So that was nice. And then another really interesting point we found was that um, there, were, there were actually two isolates of, of Saccharomyces cerevisiae that we found from, from the same plant, and uh, lots of different isolates of the yeast called Tyrellospora delbruchii. Um, but you might be tempted to think, and we certainly were initially, that if you have the same yeast and you identify that with a, a short genome sequencing, that that yeast is going to behave just as well as any other yeast that's called the same thing, right? So one Tyrellospora delbruchii is going to be the same as another. But we found that that's definitely not the case, right? So you can see here that those, uh, fr those four um, green squares up there correspond to, to four different isolates that are all as far as we could tell with our preliminary screening, all exactly the same species of yeast, and yet they behave completely differently. They, they, um, one of them hardly grows at all, the other two intermediate, and then the, the final one grows incredibly well, produces lots of ethanol. And not only that, but um, the, the small-scale beers produced by these yeasts smelt completely differently as well. And so this uh, is hinting that although there's certainly diversity in the, the species of yeast that's out there, that the strain um, diversity and the metabolism of these yeasts is also incredibly diverse and exciting to uh, explore further. So we could um, successfully capture some yeast from around Brisbane. Could we actually make some tasty beer with it? So of course we, uh, we had to try this out. So here this is a, a small batch that I made at home, but we're beginning to, in collaboration with Newstead, scale this up a little bit. So we have tried a couple. The first Tyrellospora pretoriensis, yeah, it was it's really not so good, right? It, um, it smelt kind of promising and a little sort of floral, but um, yeah, it didn't really, didn't, didn't uh, go back to that one. That's okay, you've got to try lots and, and a few succeed, right? So one, one of the ones which was identified as Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeah, was pretty good, right? I mean, it had really nice tropical notes and uh, a taste that was bready, right? We call this one bready McBread face, right? It's, but it's bready, it was good. Um, not too bad. Um, but my personal favorite so far um, is uh, Tyrellospora delbruchii, which was a fantastically sort of floral smelling uh, uh, bouquet, and then a really nice crisp, tart, and sour um, acidity to it, um, and, and almost a sort of a creamy um, velvetiness to the, to the taste from that acidity. So um, there's definitely some promising yeasts out there, but you just have to screen quite a few, right? So we've, we went from uh, several hundred um, isolates from the initial screenings down to only a handful, which look as if they might be promising. Okay, so what's the future of the funk? Well, we're really interested, at least I'm really interested, in understanding what it is about the metabolism of these yeasts that drives the production of these really interesting flavors. Right? So, for instance, we could see that there's the four uh, strains of, of Tyrellospora delbruchii that have totally different um, ethanol producing and, and flavor profiles. Presumably, that's driven by the metabolism of the yeast, the secondary metabolites that are produced 
um, produce these ester-like flavors that, that dominate the flavor of the beer. And it would be very interesting to pursue the genome sequence and the enzymology and the metabolism of these yeast to understand what's going on there. Then everyone, I think, is, is rightly proud of, of Australia's lovely native fauna and flora. I think we should be just as proud of Australia's native yeasts, right? Just because we can't see them, they're all around us, and they're, they're probably unique, not only useful for making beer, but really interesting in an ecological context, right? What, what yeast are out there? What fungi are out there? How do they interact with Australian native and introduced insects and plants? And what's the, the ecology and the, the chemical diversity that's there? There's a whole lot of really interesting fundamental science as well as useful science to be um, explored there. And then, of course, finally, we're going to make some beer. Right, so in collaboration with Newstead Brewing, we're really keen to, to step this up. And of course, we've got water and barley and hops, but then we, we won't just use our stock standard yeast. We'll be able to use our wonderful array of, of exciting, diverse native Brisbane yeasts to make some truly spectacular beer for you all to enjoy. So with that, I'd like to close and uh, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. We'll give you a moment to catch your breath, enjoy one of these fine beverages here. Um, sort of similar to an English beer, I guess. Um, too soon? Okay, and on that note, it's your chance to interrogate Ben, ask your questions. So Gurion and Elle will be coming around collecting your question slips or asking on Twitter, uh, hashtag BrizScience. In the meantime, if you enjoyed tonight's talk and you want to see more of Ben, you can check out Food Lab on SBS, where Ben's talked about his Vegemite beer. Uh, you can also see me on there. And a whole lot of other great UQ scientists. So that's all on SBS On Demand and on Replace at the moment. Um, or you can check out the Briz Science website and see a whole lot of talks from the past on a range of topics, food science and more. And uh, so you can check those out there. Next month, we are back with Briz Science. And this time, we, uh, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, time we're talking about yeasts and friendly yeasts. Next month, we're talking about less desirable microorganisms, uh, superbugs. So we're talking about the superbug war, arming ourselves to defend against antibiotic-resistant infections. And so we've got a couple of scientists who are going to have a bit of a panel discussion there, as well as their own presentations. So don't miss that. Register online. Uh, Gurian is going to come and bring those question slips up any second now. Um, um, um. No, that's quite all right. Thank you very much. All right. So, all right, first question of the rank here. What is the global and Australian yeast biodiversity? That's a marvellous question. And unfortunately, as the, the, to the best of my knowledge, the answer is that we really don't know. Right? Um, the, I, I mean, uh, we're scientists are still discovering new species of, of insect, right? So let alone uh, microorganisms like bacteria and yeast. That um, it's a whole exciting new world that uh, is beginning to be discovered and investigated using the advances in genome sequencing. Right? So, for instance, there's um, a whole research group at um, at the School of Chemistry and Molecular Biosciences, where, where I work at the University of Queensland, called the Australian Centre for Ecogenomics. And they basically sequence all the things, right? They go out, collect samples from diverse uh, microbiomes and sequence them to understand the diversity of microorganisms that, that are in those environments. Um, and they're focused on bacteria, but there's an absolutely extraordinary diversity just within the bacteria. Um, I'm sure that there are similar uh, ecological diversities within a fungal microbiomes in all sorts of different environments. And it's a really exciting opportunity to begin to go out and explore that. Right. OK, we've got a few questions around technical process type <laughs> things. People so want to do one, this at home. That's good. Yeah, that's right. We'll get to that. <laughs> so the question is, how do you go from small, uh, small sample quantities of yeast to commercial quantities? Sure. So I guess the going from, from small 
um, quantities to large quantities um, fits in with a, a screening workflow, right? So when we start, we're, we're isolating wild yeast. We've got no idea how they're going to perform in a brewing environment, if they're even going to grow, and if they do, if they're going to be tasty. And so there, we just want to grab as many as we can. But then, um, at the early stages of, of growth and at selection, we want to keep things small scale, so it's, it's cheap and easy to screen those hundreds or even thousands of different isolates. And so we keep things at, at small scale and uh, try to apply quite stringent uh, screening tests at, at each stage. Right? So we'll, we'll screen lots of yeast, then we'll test hundreds to see if they can grow on wort, only those that can, so maybe 10% of those will then take to a, a HPLC or gas chromatography screen, and then only those that seem to produce ethanol and can grow will proceed to a, a sensory, which has to be done outside the lab in, in a commercial brewing environment, but at perhaps a, a five liter scale. We're, we're talking maybe sort of five or 10 at a time there. And then those um, we'll taste, and only those which we think are gonna be good which are tasty and we think will sell, will then be upscaled to, a, to make sort of a, a couple of hundred liters, and if it's more popular than 10,000 liters. So there's, there's a nice sort of incremental steps at each time, and it's not like you go out, or rather you could go out and just select at the first random yeast that you found, but it would be very unlikely that that one would work in a, in a 10,000 liter fermentation first try. And so I get the follow-up question, which sort of answered there was, if you find the technical term some kick-ass yeast, <laughs> Uh, will the plan be to eventually cultivate it and put into production for all brewers to buy and make beer? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. I mean, we're, we're keen to get these, if we find some kick-ass yeast, which I'm sure we will, we're absolutely keen that, that as many people as possible can, can have access to that. Yeah. Bridge Science wants 10% of any royalties if you use that <laughs> name. Should have put your name on that question. Sorry out there. Um, okay. How did you protect the wort from a wild yeast when you were testing the other yeasts? Sure, so in, in the workflow that we've done, we've performed that in laboratory environments, right? So we've, we've collected the yeast around Brisbane and we've taken those, those yeasts into, or the, the uh, vegetable material into the lab and then we've worked in sterile microbiological conditions inside the lab. And so there it's in that sort of environment, it's relatively easy to keep things sterile. We can take a, a clonal, uh, colony from yeast and use that to inoculate a small starter culture and then use that to, to inoculate a, a larger culture. So in the lab, that's quite easy. It's not too difficult to, to do that sort of thing at home as well, um, but you just need to be uh, a little bit more careful about your microbiological techniques. Yep. So, and that, that leads on to a question. We got one from Twitter from Adzi and another one here around is it dangerous for the home brewer to harvest and brew with wild yeast without all your fancy science equipment? Sure. So I'm not entirely sure of the answer to this, right? And I certainly can't guarantee anyone's safety. But I guess all, all I can say is that there's a long history of it, right? I mean, if you look at, at what people did to make their lambics, right, they just leave it outside and <laughs> collect what falls into it, right? So I, I, I would guess that... Um, if, if it tastes good enough to drink, it's probably not too bad for you. <laughs> there are some pretty strange beers out there, but fair enough, okay. Um, you haven't died yet, right? So. This, this is true. Uh, people, eat a lot, well, people eat Vegemite, so I don't know if Australians <laughs> are the best taste here. Um, why is it that beer is safe to homebrew, but not spirits? It's probably more of a, a legal and a regulatory question. Um, but that said, um, making beer, you just need to boil some, some stuff, boil some water, then let it cool, inoculate it, and then it grows, right? So it's not too, there's not too much engineering in that. But then when you get to distilling, then you're, you're heating and you're boiling and you're dealing with, uh, with turning ethanol and water into gases, there's the potential there for things to go wrong, right, with explosions and with burns. And so it's probably that extra step in, in process engineering which led to the stricter regulations around that. But it's certainly possible. Um, okay, a couple, more, you got, can yeah. a couple more questions? Keep Good, because there's a lot of questions here <laughs> oh, that's today. Great. <laughs> um, what is the cause of the flavour and fermentation differences between subspecies of yeasts? <laughs> 
And can positive trait, evolutionary traits be driven in the lab in the short term? Mm, so the first question, what's, the, what's the, the mechanism by which the different species, or sorry, different uh, strains of yeast have different flavor characteristics? We don't know, right? And that's something which is, I'm really, really interested in, in pursuing and finding out. It's probably got to do with different, uh, the presence of, of genes that encode different enzymes or the levels of those enzymes that can produce those secondary metabolites and esters. Um, and as to whether they can be evolved in the lab or, or at home, I'd say they, they can be. So um, certainly brewer's yeast that's used commercially, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it is domesticated, right? So it's as different, the genome of Saccharomyces cerevisiae is, is as different from the wild versions of Saccharomyces cerevisiae as a, uh, as a horse is from a, from a wild horse, right? Or, or as uh, the crops that we use, so wheat is, for instance, from, from wild grass, right? So there's been domestication of the, um, of the yeast. It's just that people didn't know what they were doing, right? They were sort of going from, from slop to slop, selecting perhaps for the batches of beer that had the, the best taste or the least worst taste. And so those, um, <laughs> those, uh, those properties appear to be possible to, um, to select for because we already have nice tasting ales and lagers. Yep. It's possible to do it again. Um, perhaps a more, more simple question, what elements dictate the color of the beer? The color of the beer. So um, the color of the beer is, is largely determined by how much malt goes into the beer, how much barley is in the beer. So if you have only a, a small amount of barley, so uh, relative to, to water, then the, there'll, be, there'll be a lower concentration of proteins and sugars that go into the, into the um, wort. Conversely, if you've got lots of barley and only a little bit of water, then you'll have a really high concentration. Um, then the other key factor is when the malt is produced, so it's, it's allowed to germinate, and then that germination is stopped before the seed starts to grow by kilning, so it's heated in an oven. And um, that can just lightly dry the, the malt, or it can burn the malt right, and turn it black. And you only need a, a little bit of that burnt malt barley in a, in a brew to make it look like a Guinness or even darker. Um, Sarab on Twitter asks, Hi, Ben. Why do Guinness bubbles fall down instead of going up? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they still go up, actually. But um, <laughs> unless you're on your head after having too many, that's the answer. <laughs> but uh, but they, are, they are different from, from normal bubbles because um, the, the bubbles in beer are normally carbon dioxide right, that's, um, that's put back into the beer after fermentation, um, whereas, whereas Guinness um, is, I believe, uh, nitrogen is used um, as the gas for that, and just because of the properties of nitrogen as a gas versus carbon dioxide, the bubbles are much smaller, and so it, it gives the head a, a much sort of tighter, foamy, creamier um, pack, but they still, still go up. Uh, and I, I actually tackle that a little bit. Almost all the bubbles... Sorry, I'm a physics guy, right? Uh, Almost all the bubbles do go up, um, except that uh, because these bubbles are so tiny and so energetic, they tend to drag up a lot of liquid with them in the beer in the middle. And then what happens is the beer then sort of gets to the top and starts to fall down. On the very outside, it will drag down some very small bubbles on the outside that looks like on the outside the bubbles... Um, kind of rain down. Um, it only happens just after it's poured, so you really need to set, settle in for a long night of science if you want to see that. That's um, fantastic. I, I just thought it was I'd had too many Guinnesses. That's yeah, great. no, great, That's great way to get a tax fantastic. deduction on your Guinness. <laughs> um, last question, uh, well, actually, no, second last question is, what's your address and when's the party? <laughs> So I'll, I'll let the mysterious person introduce themselves to you <laughs> later. Um, but otherwise, last question is, any tips for the home brewer and what's your favourite beer? Wow. Um, I guess first my, my tips for the, the home brewer would um, just be to, to get out there and try as much as you can, right? Um, the, the, it's uh, easy to get in to, to the game and making home brew, um, but it's quite easy to play around with ingredients. I mean, getting yeasts is, is it's kind of difficult, right? But, but it's, it's certainly possible, but it's easy to make beer at home uh, interesting without going to all that trouble, right? You can play around with ingredients, with styles, and it's, uh, it's exciting, right, to make stuff yourself. Um, and I've forgotten what was the last question. And yet, to finish, your favorite beer. My favorite beer. Um, 
so far, I guess, you know, wait till exactly. you're Exactly. So, I mean, the, the correct answer is probably whatever I'm drinking at the moment, but um, um, I'm... I, I'm really excited about the sours at the moment. I mean, I don't think it's just this project that I'm involved with. I, I think I'm a little ho hoppy beers uh, are nice, right? But a nice crisp sour on a on a Brisbane summer's day is special. Well, I encourage everybody to go and check out some great sour beers and more craft beers, and otherwise, and um, do your own research and get everything going. So. Uh, Unfortunately, we, we do have a small gift for you, but it comes in a bag that does not contain beer. Um, but otherwise, could you please join me in thanking our fantastic speaker tonight, Ben Shaw's from UQ. Thank you very much. And please join us for some food and drinks outside afterwards. <laughs>